Today we have the privilege of speaking with former Representative Lee C. Tadanio, who was a Republican member who served the 25th District, which encompasses parts of Allegheny and Westmoreland counties mm -hmm. from 1973 through 1982. Mm -hmm. Representative, thank you for thank joining you. us as part of this project. Thank you for having me. I'd just briefly like you to talk about your early life, your education, your educational career, and some of the careers you had prior to running for the House seat. Okay. Uh, well, I started off, I went to the uh, University of Notre Dame, become a civil engineer. Uh, the only thing I knew after four years of civil engineering was I didn't want to be a civil engineer. So <laughs> then I went to Pitt to get my MBA. And uh, after that, I had a, uh, I was in ROTC, so I had a military commitment uh, coming up. And uh, as, as luck would have it, uh, I got assigned, uh, this was during the Vietnam War, uh, I was sweating that one out, but mm -hmm. I got assigned to Washington, D.C., to the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, uh, who, uh, and the reason I got assigned there was because they were putting in a computer system, which was pretty new at the time. And through my college career, I became familiar with uh, computers, which they were brand new. And since I had the background they wanted me down there, so I installed uh, and led the ins installation of a an IBM 36030 computer down in the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology at the time and ran an organization of about 30 people. And uh, it was very nice. So I was in the Army for a couple of years and I stayed on as a, civ a civilian. And uh, my wife and I were living down in Washington and uh, I got involved in the uh, JCs at the time because we were looking to meet people. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's the reason we joined to meet people. Well, I found out very quickly that the JCs is a very active organization, <laughs> and I was, I was observing like the officers and so forth down there. I said, "These guys don't have a home life. They don't do it. They're here all the time." You know, I said, "I never want to do that." So uh, <laughs> after we were down there about six years in Washington, we decided, "Well, we really wanted to come back to Pittsburgh," so we did, and we moved back here, and I moved to Murraysville, where I live today. It was back in 1969. Um, and when we moved there, of course, we went through the thing about trying to meet people again. My mother, I remember my mother, <laughs> she <was> my <laughs> wife. <laughs> uh, she signed me up for uh, a, a brand new JC chapter they were trying to start oh. there because she knew I was in the JC to go away to meet people and so forth. And uh, it turned out that the individual that uh, was organizing the effort was a classmate of mine from Notre Dame. Oh. And he was uh, branching out from another chapter in Monroeville uh, just to form this chapter. So uh, again, like the computer thing, I was the only person of the recruits that had any background in JCs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, at the organizational meeting, I, my friend was the president, charter president the first year, and I was the vice president which led to becoming the president the next year uh, you know, the, to a uh, position I said I would never uh, become. <laughs> <laughs> but somehow it worked out and <laughs> I adapted somewhat. Um, and at, at this time I was working for Westinghouse Nuclear Energy Systems as a systems analyst. And, uh, but it, it really wasn't uh, my bag. I was looking for something else to, to get into. I always had been uh, drawn toward government, you know, mm -hmm. fascinated by it, was studied in high school and so forth. So, uh, it, it happened at a Christmas party, the, uh, the, then the Westmoreland County chairman <coughs> approached me, they said they were looking for a candidate because they had just gone through reapportionment, they carved out a brand new district, uh, which they cut off parts of other districts and that, and uh, is going to go in Westmoreland County, one third in Westmoreland County, two thirds in Allegheny County. They were looking for somebody to run from Westmoreland County because they heard that there was going to be three Allegheny County candidates running, which was fine with me. I said, that sounds interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take a flyer, you know. Uh, well, right after I uh, filed, two of the three Allegheny County candidates dropped out. <laughs> oh, wow. So there I was one-on-one -on -one with a, uh, a seasoned Republican committee woman as an opponent, which, you know, could have been disastrous, especially for a neophyte. So I had to do some quick on-the-job training and learning 
But I also found out that despite being a committee woman for so many years, she had wasn't universally liked. So I was able to take care of that, make some allegiances and so forth, and, and triumphed in the uh, primary. Well, <laughs> so well, it's like uh, Robert Redford in the Canada, you know, what do I do now? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but it turned out that the uh, Democrat primary turned out the way they envisioned the Republican primary, that there was three Democrat candidates who split the vote, and a Westmoreland County candidate won, which didn't set well with the Allegheny Democrats. Mm -hmm. And they looked at me as being easier to defeat next time than this other guy if he was the incumbent. So I got a lot of Democratic support. Mm. A district uh, that was, was carved out was <coughs> about 55% Democrat. But I think Ed Hussey at the time was uh, you know, the legal counsel for Republicans and he was very involved in reapportionment. Mm -hmm. And they didn't look at the registration exam, they looked at the voting patterns mm -hmm. and they saw that it voted Republican, which turned out to be true. So make a long story short, I, you know, it was a, a big campaign. I was learning on a job as we went, uh, doing all the different things you're supposed to do. And uh, in the end, I won, uh, and at the time I say I was, <coughs> I was working for Westinghouse, the, the salary then was $15,600 a year, which was a little less than what I was making at Westinghouse, plus the fact that you know, I had a growing family and everything. I knew I couldn't really live on that, but Westinghouse was a you know, cooperative, and they were, when I went to run, they were cooperative and encouraging, and they, uh, it also took me on as a uh, for a part-time uh, consultant, mm. and since I was on computer, and I could, that worked out real well because I could do programming and so forth. When I was there, <coughs> when I wasn't there, I didn't. You know, I just worked on an hourly basis. So that worked out quite nicely for the first few years I was elected. <coughs> <coughs> but uh, I guess that answers your question about what happened before I got elected. Uh, well, not coming from a political family necessarily. Uh, where, how did you find yourself becoming a Republican? Well, I always register with the predominant party. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in uh, Washington, I registered as a Democrat because of John Kennedy. Sure. When I moved to Murraysville, that's all all local politics was Republican, so I registered as a Republican. You know, I don't know the difference between parties. I didn't find out the difference between the parties until I came down here. <laughs> you know, I just figured that you know, you're Republican. Uh, if you want to influence local elections, you got to vote in a Republican primary. So mm -hmm. that's okay. that was the reason I was. I, I wasn't a strong party person. I, I didn't know what really what politics was at the time. And, uh, I was one of those new people who just was fascinated with the idea of representative government and democracy and all that other stuff. And, so I'll put it to work, see what happens. <coughs> so you have two candidates from Westmoreland County <coughs> in a predominantly Allegheny County district. Mm -hmm. What types of campaigning did you do to try to get your name recognized in the other part of the county? Well, <coughs> a lot of things we do. Door knocking was very popular then. Mm -hmm. I think I knocked on about a couple thousand doors uh, every weekend or whatever, night, I would go out and <coughs> knock on doors. <coughs> We'd have coffees, <coughs> excuse me, coffees in various areas where neighbors would get their neighbor, neighbors to come in and I'd go there and talk about different things. Uh, send out mailings. Uh, the other thing was recruiting volunteers and taking advantage of <coughs> drawing alliances, finding people that for one reason or another, didn't like the other candidate, but were willing to support me here. Or, and were willing to work at it. That was the key thing. Pe mm -hmm. A lot of people give you lip service, but mm -hmm. people that really want to do, it, do the work. That's where part of my JC background came, because the JCs, you have to get people to work. Right. <coughs> oh. And uh, yeah, I have a glass of water. OK, thank you. The first campaign 
he won by a little over 2,000 votes. Yeah. Second campaign, it was a little less than 2,000 votes. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then from thereafter, you won pretty handily yeah. in each of your campaigns. Yeah. What changed after the first two uh, well, elections? Well, remember, after I was elected, and uh, since I was in Democratic District, I spent most of that first term trying to shore up my base, mm -hmm. and I didn't pay as much attention to legislation as I could have. Mm -hmm. I was more concerned with you know building that base so I could get reelected, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I remember I was working very hard at it, <coughs> and uh, <coughs> I was talking to Vic Westerberg, who was the chairman of the House Transportation Committee at the time, and I said, you know, I'm working real hard at this. Uh, maybe the, be, if I work real hard at it, the Democrats won't necessarily think they can win. They will put up a candidate. He said, don't worry about it. Don't give a candidate and put up a candidate. <laughs> so this is a swing seat. They're going to go after you. So I said, well, but the... The, <coughs> the work I did was not in vain. That second election was probably the, the most critical thing, or the, the biggest event that I ever did in my life. Uh, because everything turned right for the Democrats. When I won my first election, it was during the Watergate year, or it was during Nixon landslide before Watergate. So Nixon swept people in the office and they said, yeah, I won because, yeah, know, the, know that. Now, this is four years later, there's Watergate, there's uh, Schaap is running to be reelected and, and we thought he was not going to get a lot of support, but <coughs> it turned out the other way. It was a Democratic year, a Democratic district. The Democrats put up a candidate who was about my age and was a former president of JCs, very popular, very well known in Monroeville. I was a dead man. Well, we worked our butts off. Yeah. <laughs> I had uh, over 200 volunteers in that uh, election. And these were working volunteers, like I said, I emphasize that. And we had it organized to the hilt, you know, by our district, by everything else. Uh, and we did everything we could possibly think of. Some things I think of today, I wonder why I did it. <laughs> it was like uh, at one point we were going to do a fundraiser and some of the fire department people are supporting me. said, so we do a bingo every, every week. Run a bingo. We know all about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that sounds good. He said, the only thing is you've got to give a big prize. You've got to give $1,000 away. Okay. That'll get people to come. Mm -hmm. Well. The night of the bingo, we were sweating that one. <laughs> I said, this is going to cost me money. <laughs> well, we, we finally did a little bit better break even, but <laughs> it was an experience. Yeah. <clears throat> but anyway, after that election, uh, as it turned out, we won. Now, uh, nobody's expecting us to win. We won a Republican and a Democratic year. And I think <clears throat> that put to bed the opposition, serious opposition, to think that they could beat me again. And uh, after that, the next three elections were, were fairly easy because uh, they didn't have a good candidate. And we knew what we were doing and that kind of thing. We'll talk a little bit more about the district itself, the people, uh, the, the jobs that they held, <coughs> the demographics of the district, the geography. Uh, what, what did the 25th district look like? Well, it's a bedroom community. Uh, a suburb, mostly Monroeville. Uh, Monroeville, <coughs> a big, big shopping area on the east uh, part of Pittsburgh. Uh, a lot of uh, <coughs> uh, middle class housing that was built after the war. Mm -hmm. Then it has a couple smaller communities like Pitcairn and Wilmerding, which were like uh, mill towns mm -hmm. with more blue collar people in them. Out in Murraysville, where I came from, <coughs> it was a little more affluent, but still uh, of the similar to Monroeville. Uh, so uh, I would say basically a uh, conservative type district. Uh, it was Democrat by registration, but you know, like I say, not by voting pattern. Uh, <coughs> Monroeville was. Almost 50-50 at 
uh, actually, it's a little more Democrat registration. Mur Mur Murraysville was Republican re registration, but it was only like you know one third of the district. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> the uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, at the time, there was no uh, <laughs> not much in the way of uh, low income people there, uh, except maybe a few in the. Pitcairn Wilmington area, which we're working for. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but that, that's basically the flavor of the district at the time. Did you have a district office? Yes. In there? <coughs> the second term I've had a district office, <coughs> <coughs> an old log cabin. Mm. <laughs> it was interesting because uh, one end of the, uh, the, like the conference room where you walked in where the secretary was everything. Uh, the ceiling was like 12 feet on this side, and on the other side it was like 10 feet. Oh. <laughs> you could see the floor. <coughs> but uh, it wasn't uh, a lot to look at, but it, it had a lot of exposure. You had a, a, a busy Northern Pike, uh, Monroeville, a lot of traffic. We put a sign up there. We got a lot of. We didn't get a lot of customers coming, stopping in, but. You saw that sign every day, so. mm -hmm. uh, and that, it was it was a, a period when it was <coughs> relatively novel to have a district office. Right. So. My office was open like I think three days, only three days a week for a couple hours in, a week. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> but uh, it was there. I mean, it was the first step. Yeah. What types of issues or problems did people come to you with from the district? Well, <coughs> you know, pe people always had their own variety of things, but there were some local issues that I got involved in that first term. Uh, one was the uh, Route 22 bypass in Murraysville. This is an issue that, <coughs> excuse me, I hate this. Uh, <coughs> for uh, about uh, five or 10 years, they proposed to do a, a bypass through, Mon through Murraysville, uh, you know, the time to create the, make the Pittsburgh Parkway longer <coughs> and uh, eliminate traffic in Murraysville. But it got bogged down. And primarily it got bogged down because <coughs> there was a doctor there, Dr. Townsend, who, <coughs> who his wife was, had been very involved in the environmental movement and establishment of a uh, park park there called Duff Park, which ran along the, the creek, Turtle Creek, along there, high, along, near the highway. And she died. And of course, he was looking at it as a memorial to her. And the uh, line of the highway would take a good bit of Duff Park. And he didn't like that. He was politically connected with Shap. And he stopped it, basically, it the environmental thing and all the other things. So it was an impasse when I got elected. <coughs> I was thinking that, look, 90% of the people in Murraysville want this bypass. He's out there standing and stopping it. So I've got to be able to do something to that. So I worked and worked and worked at it. Finally, I got Townsend to agree to a compromise. The, working with the highway part of the we <coughs> moved the highway down so it wouldn't uh, affect as much of the property, take a little bit of Duff Park, but not much. <clears throat> he was willing to go with that. Our supervisors w weren't. <laughs> they said, we want it all or nothing. Oh. And I, I told them, I said, you're going to get nothing. Yeah. No, we're going to want everything. Yeah. So we had meetings and everything, and they wouldn't budge. They wouldn't take the rational approach. <clears throat> and I'm saying, look, all these people want this. You guys are making a ridiculous stand. Uh, let's, I say, how can I get the people involved in this? So, they came up with the idea of a, what they call a plebiscite, where we can bring in the voting machines from, mm -hmm. and the people can vote on it whether they want it or not. Mm -hmm. So everybody agreed to that. <coughs> I figured, no, we got it made now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's when the first termer learns <laughs> <laughs> things. Um, when you have an election, you got to get the word out to the people. Uh, and of course, they don't have a lot of money to do that. And we had meetings and things like that <coughs> that we needed to do. Uh, but there was a couple p 
people that weren't happy with the compromise, in addition to the supervisors. <coughs> uh, one was a, a guy called Jun named Junior Hall, who's since deceased. But he had a couple pieces of property down there, commercial property, right along Route 22, that this would, the line would go through. Another was a, a group of uh, <coughs> people in the neighborhood called Marley Acres, which thought this highway is going to go too close to them. It's going to be noisy. Mm -hmm. Well, <coughs> uh, so we went through this whole thing. And about a week before the election, this junior hall buys these ads in the local paper, trees and weeds versus the highway. <laughs> But he's trying to frame the issue that <laughs> you're going to vote for the highway or you're going to vote for the trees and weeds. Yeah. And so they figured that they were going to get, get their way. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, he swayed everybody to vote against their best interest. They voted against the compromise. <coughs> and as expected, the administration backed off from it and said, no, we're not going to, we've got a lot of highway projects around. We're not going to build this one. It's interesting now, <coughs> here it is 50 years later, uh, almost 50 years later, they just finished a couple, no, about five years ago, uh, re, redoing Route 22. It's not a bypass. They just made it from three lanes to four lanes. It's now impossible to get from, from one side of the town to the other. They got five additional traffic lights. It's a mess. So, yeah. It all came out of this whole thing that mm -hmm. uh, we couldn't couldn't pull it off. But I say I learned things from it. <coughs> uh, <coughs> it was fun while it lasted, but mm -hmm. I would have much rather have seen the uh, rationality uh, take hold. <coughs> Another issue was uh, big at the time was the hospital mm -hmm. uh, Mer in uh, Monroeville. Minerva, when I, we moved out there, there was no hospital. You had to go to Oakland, basically, or Wilkinsburg, you know, the Columbia Hospital, which was, had a terrible reputation. Uh, and I was sensitive to this because when my daughter was two years old, well, down in Washington, she dropped a Pepsi bottle, a glass Pepsi bottle, and exploded. A glass piece of the glass went right up there, right ne next to her eye, and just sliced her mm -hmm. head. And we had to take her by ambulance to the uh, hospital and so forth. And it was, uh, it, she turned out fine, but they brought to my attention the need to have a facility nearby. <coughs> and since we didn't have anything, I said, <coughs> <coughs> we need to do something about this. Well, there was a, there's a, there was a group working on that in uh, Monroeville. They hadn't been getting too far along. Then uh, Columbia uh, came along and they, they were trying to, do something. So these two got kind of got into a fight <laughs> with each other. One didn't want to take the other one. And, <clears throat> and like I say, the Columbia had a bad reputation, so the people didn't want Columbia coming and building another Columbia hospital there. Uh, so it got to be a, a real free for all. Now, again, an impasse. Oh, I, I got involved there in trying to get organized the uh, <coughs> su public support for uh, getting to compromise and got uh, the various municipalities and so forth pass resolutions uh, calling on these people to get off their duff. <coughs> Finally, it came to pass. And it came Forbes Hospital mm -hmm. in uh, Monroeville. Of course, now got UPMC fighting them. Right. <laughs> right. <their> own. <laughs> but, yeah. but, uh, but at least that was a, a, a little bit of a victory. I, I kind of taking the major share of the credit for that, but I mean, at least I was involved in working on it, and it was important to me. Uh, the other piece of legislation that I was very involved in, in fact, I started picking up from when I was running the first time. I got that from one of the, uh, Jim Bedford, who was going to be one of the other Republican candidates that had to drop out. He ended up, I got him to be my campaign manager in my first term, but but one of the things, issues with him was uh, spending limitations, con constitutional spending limits. Uh, at that time, I proposed that Milton Friedman, who's a Nobel laureate and so forth, 
Uh, then we got to talking about it, and the more I heard it, the more I liked it. So I'd introduced it that first term and so forth. Of course, it didn't go anywhere because I didn't have the capability to do much with it. But I, I just uh, you know, bided my time until, well, the next two times, the Democrats were in the majority. And when that happens, you know, the party is in the minority, you know, they uh, play games or mm-hmm. <coughs> or uh, just object to what the other party's doing. They, you can't do anything. Mm-hmm. Finally, in my fourth term, the Republicans got to be a majority. Thornburg was running for governor. I got Thornburg interested in, in the idea. And, and so he kind of added it to his campaign. So I thought, oh, we're, we're moving. The boat's finally going to move. So uh, they got together. I got uh, together with some people, Carnegie Mellon, uh, uh, Alan Meltzer, as another uh, economist, noted economist, and Peter Ordeshuk, another professor down there. And they were they worked with me on developing this concept and so forth. And we got a lot of other things going. Uh, we had a, a statewide tax limitation committee and uh, a lot of other things going trying to get this this bill pushed. And uh, like I say, it, it was introduced, it became House Bill 1, the first bill public, uh, introduced that year. And it showed the fact that that, that title is usually reserved for legislation that they want to highlight and whatever else. So they held it for us. <coughs> and uh, I figured, well, we got to, almost got this knock now. We got the governor and everything else. Well. Well, uh, the governor, uh, legislative assistant, uh, point man, was George Seidel, who was at the teachers' union before that. Mm-hmm. And guess what? Teachers' union were not in favor of this. <laughs> they hated it. Mm-hmm. There, there were two groups that hated it, teachers' union and local governments, mainly because it, it restricted their ability to spend or, or to, to, as teachers mm-hmm. unlimited salaries, whatever. So I think that had the effect of at least moderating what the governor's involvement. Uh, uh, <coughs> but <coughs> we still were able to get through the House. Well, very, very strong vote. But the Senate wouldn't take it up. The Senate was Democratic hands. So uh, finally, we got, I got to the point where we were going to do a parliamentary maneuver we're going to amend a uh, Senate bill that, uh, that amends the Constitution uh, with our bill and send it back to them. Because then they can't let it sit in committee. They've got to vote on it on the floor. Ironically, <laughs> the bill we picked was uh, a, a bill that uh, Fumo, Senator Fumo had sponsored. Fumo was not a friend of this type of legislation. <laughs> he was ticked off, of course, from we would amend his bill <laughs> make him the prime sponsor of the spending limit. But anyway, we amended it and sent it over there. <laughs> See, it has uh, constitutionally, a constitutional amendment has to pass two separately elected uh, legislatures, mm-hmm. and it has to be done 90 days before the election, which meant we had to pass it in July. So this is July, and when we recess, we're not coming back till September. So. This was our only chance to get it passed. So I went over to the Senate, like on Monday, we had the votes. Ed Early was uh, the senator, I think, is going to amend it over there and put it in. Uh, and we were counting the heads and everything like that. So we had, it. well, that that weren't going to be able to vote until the next day. So but overnight, PSA were at work, changed enough votes. <coughs> that they decided to table it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's the closest we came to a constitutional spending limit uh, because that killed it for the year. Uh, but we had a good bill, and I, I still I firmly believe that... You still think it would be relevant today? Oh, I, I think it's the only thing that's going to save us. Because mm-hmm. right now, there everybody wants money. Everybody has a cause that's needy that you can't vote against. Nobody's up there saying, we don't have enough money to spend. 
uh, are we looking at the total pocketbook? Or, you know, you know, if you have your home budget, you got so much money coming in, you know how much you can spend, and you don't overspend. There's no control on government. Government just keeps writing the checks. So it keeps going up and up, and uh, it, it never stops. This constitutional amendment would give them some backbone. Mm -hmm. uh, it would stop it. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get it. And uh, say it has to be a constitutional amendment, because if you make it legislative, they can always vote to override it. Right. So, <coughs> but so far, uh, I've been hoping that it's going to come back up again. Some somebody will champion it or whatever else, but mm -hmm. it hasn't. Uh, although I did see uh, the Senate did introduce a similar legislation earlier this year, but I, I don't know if anything's going to happen to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, and that's uh, probably my biggest disappointment is the fact that we, we didn't get that passed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You were successful in, in, in some of your own pieces of legislation. I think you had five pieces of legislation signed into law plus a pamphlet law and that was that was introduced. Mm -hmm. um, why did you find success in those certain areas that, that you legislated? Uh, were there projects that were needed? Yeah, for well, various reasons. Like, you know, um, areas, uh, certain laws, if they're, if they're not, they really don't uh, affect a lot of different places. Uh, they're easier to pass, <laughs> or if, if there's a general consensus for it, it's not controversial. They're easier right. to pass. Uh, so, uh, if, if if you really got something that that is, that's uh, sea changing, you're going to fight, mm -hmm. and you're going to win or you're going to lose. Uh, but uh, a lot of times, uh, a lot of those bills, and they, they, they didn't involve a lot of uh, controversy, a lot of work, but uh, it's just a matter of building a consensus and putting it out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, legislators, like anybody else, they like to go along and get along with people. If somebody, somebody says they need this for their district, they'll, they'll give them the vote, Yeah, mm -hmm. type of thing. Uh, One of the issues you were involved with that's still coming up today is downsizing the legislature. Yeah. Um, that has been introduced the last two sessions. Um, why did you feel that was a necessary piece of legislation to, to champion? Well, actually I don't anymore. Mm. The fact that I, I, my experience in the legislature showed me that I think it'd be bad. Mm. Uh, part of the problem with the democracy right now is that uh, money is controlling everything. Now, the larger you make a district, you make a small, you make the legislature smaller. You give more constituents. You make it more difficult to run for that office. It make it more expensive. So you've got to sell your soul to get the money to vote for that. Now, a, a legislative district, I think we had about 20, 25,000 voters when I was there. Uh, now, that that's about the most you can get to without a huge amount of expenditure yeah because uh, TV is overkill and things like that but you can you can do word of mouth a lot of other things but mm. once you get beyond that number it makes it more and more difficult to get elected in fact that was one of the reasons why I, I didn't I opted not to run for the Senate when I had a chance to do that uh, to say it's gonna remove me I'm gonna have to I've got to make compromises to get the money to be elected. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, like I say, I, I think that's the thing that people don't realize when they, they look at it as strictly as an economic thing, that they're going to save money on the legislature. Well, you're not looking at what it's going to cost you in the long run. Right. Right. One of your big emphasis was on computer systems, computer software. Um, you even introduced one of the first bills that we've been able to find addressing computer hacking. Uh, and back in the 1979-80 session. Yeah. Uh, what type of reception did you get from the House when you introduced the, the, this type of dynamic that uh, we're so used to today? You talk about the computer voting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that was uh, interesting. Well, again, a lot of salespeople coming around at that time because <coughs> we got this great product. We're going to do computerized voting. Uh, 
I was probably one of the few, if maybe the only one, who's ever worked with computers in the house. When I saw this thing, first of all, they were, it's interesting, even in the light of the Bush election, the first system they're talking about was a punch card system. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, And I wasn't even worried about the hanging chat. <laughs> right. <laughs> but the thing is, it's, it's very easy to change program, to, to alter the vote. Uh, and like I say, the hacking thing, which, which people are now getting to realize it, 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 it scares me even today with the, the stuff we have now, mm -hmm. the electronic systems and so forth. Uh, uh, I think we should go back to the old voting machines uh, still today. Um, because uh, the more decentralized you are, the more difficult it is to, to rig anything. Now, when you centralize everything and computerize it, uh, and now when I went out, like say when I went out and explained that to people on the floor, they they went along with it. You know, they were able to stop it a couple of times. Uh, but <coughs> but it, it's not. It's the thing about trying to be efficient is one thing, but in government you don't want to be efficient. I mean, <laughs> there's too many evils out there. I believe in, in the early 80s, um, you developed a word processing system for the house that was able to detail and print out lists. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that come about? And okay. Uh, we we're talking about uh, modernizing and so forth. And uh, I was actually, when I came here, I was kind of impressed with the state of the art uh, uh, that we had uh, uh, equipment and so forth. At that time, we had what they called magnetic card typewriters, which were precursors to word processing systems today. And every, every uh, legislator had access to them and that kind of thing, and, which was pretty good at the time. And uh, IBM was a primary uh, uh, supplier of these things to the house. So the IBM salesman stood to make a lot of money, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but as computers started developing and the capabilities were coming around, uh, things were uh, changing. And uh, again, because of my background, uh, the, the, the various, the, it, it, the caucuses, there are four caucuses, but the, mm -hmm. the House Republicans <coughs> were interested in uh, the computers for the caucus. Uh, the Democrats had already moved in that direction. And so they came to me, since I had the background, <coughs> they'd come up with a, 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 a system to select it and so forth. Well. Uh, it was it was interesting because I had done that type of thing before, mm -hmm. and I, we were looking at different uh, offerings and so forth. And uh, the Democrats in the House had selected an IBM mini computer at the time, which you know, despite IBM name and everything else, it needed to be programmed. They didn't have what they call off-the-shelf software like PCs do today. <coughs> <coughs> which means you had to have expertise too how to operate this bugger right now uh, at, uh, I think I looked four or five different manufacturers but at the time now Wang was just coming into the thing and they uh, were actually ahead of the time because they they're selling selling a computer bundled with software much like I well, get the PCs today with the word processing and database and so forth so it had, it was basically easy to operate too. So you didn't require the higher level of skill of the individual mm -hmm. to run it. Uh, and you could take it up, uh, you know, <clears throat> day one, you can, so we had uh, I, I convinced them to, to go with the Wang, which they did, and they installed it mm -hmm. over in the <coughs> uh, Irvis office building there. And uh, immediately they started uh, transcribing uh, the county voting list because they use it for mailings and newsletters and things like that. Uh, we had about 95 or six clerk typists and a manager. Hmm. Now the political things being what they are, the ones that the <coughs> leaderships chose for the manager didn't have a computer background, which, you know, if I could work with them, I, uh, uh, you know, 
maybe we could work it out. So I tried. And one of the things I tried to instill in them was the concept of backing up things. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <coughs> well, ever, we installed it, when I think we had six or seven legislators on the system with their stuff and everything like that. And everything was going well. And I remember we were home for Christmas time at recess or, for our recess. I got a call from Harrisburg. Something wrong with the computer. Oh, okay. Well, well what happens is, well, the disk is making a noise. Yeah, you know, did you put the back up it? Yeah, I did that. And it's still making the noise. It still doesn't work. I said, oh, your disk drive is bad. You know, the, the heads are ruining the disk. So take the other backup to put it in the other disk drive and, and start it up. What other backup? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> so we destroyed both of our backups, uh, our, our one backup that he has that I haven't. He's supposed to take you. you know, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm thinking, well, this uh, could be a problem. But maybe it's not as much of a problem as I think because everybody's on at home. They're not in Harrisburg. Right. Well, I, I, I held true except for one thing. The, uh, the legal counsel uh, at the time was working on something for the majority leader. <laughs> and it was working on the computer. <coughs> now, he wasn't really a friend of uh, this election because the, the, the political aspect of the selection was, of course, that we, we kicked out a lot of the IBM equipment the IBM guy just comes out and bad mouths everything about this election. Has been having bending the ear of the legal counsel about why wow, this is such a terrible thing, mm -hmm. and uh, so this just reinforces it, you know. Uh, so it's this Murphy's law is that you know, some, if it can't go wrong at will and at the worst possible time, it, it came true. Yeah. So uh, long run is we, we did finally get a, the data recovered from the old disk, but. It took some time. There was a lot of pain involved and so forth. And, and we lost some political capital in the process. Uh, then uh, what happened was that until it was my last term and I left. And after I left, there was no champion for that computer system. So I think it, it just uh, finally went to, it was finally replaced with something uh, again. Uh, but uh, what I thought was, would have been a, very good selection could have worked out really well. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't at this point uh, because lack of good staff. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, with the amount of technology we have today at our fingertips, at our disposal to use, do you think it's help more helping the process more, or hindering the process more? Uh, it helps. Mm -hmm. it, it allows you to do a lot more. Um, uh, uh, there's, there's so much more you can do now that you couldn't even touch before. Uh, information, if you use it the right way, it, it's, it can be great. Um, that's one of the things I was, I was involved with. I was on the Legislative Data Processing Committee, too, that oversaw the House Data Processing Committee. And one of the things we were looking into then at the time was uh, <coughs> large display screens. Because always <coughs> because when we were considering amendments, you know, you didn't know what amendment they're talking about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In fact, one of the one of the big reforms that we made uh, that was actually came about to be it turned out to be pretty good was uh, we put numbers on the amendments because mm -hmm. they were not numbered. They couldn't tell which. <laughs> it's just a piece of paper. This one, that one. <laughs> yeah. You know, but once they had numbers, then at least you knew what what they were talking about. But See, my idea was that, you know, with large display screen, you could put a screen up at the front of the house and, you know, you see it all. But of course, now they have PCs at their desk, which is mm -hmm. better, you know. Uh, but this type of thing we were, we were looking at back then. But like I say, as technology changes, you have to adapt and go with it and see. Uh, but now, I mean, there's so much more you can do. And of course, you can be abused, too, which we found out, too. Right. Yeah, even with all this technology, one of 
the public's, I guess, greatest criticism is the, the partisanship that we've seen in federal government, state governments. What was the atmosphere like when you served? Was, it, was there more camaraderie? Was, it, was oh, there more bipartisan it was nature? a big change. Now, I, I, you talk to anybody that served back what I did versus they're all glad they're not there now. I mean, I mean, we used to come, like say, I didn't know the difference between the parties until I got down here. Then I, I found out, well, you know, the Democrats, they do one thing. that, And we get on the floor and we fight like cats and dogs. But the difference was after... That, that evening, we'd go down to the local watering hole, whatever, and we'd socialize. And we'd talk to each other and <coughs> play games or whatever else, you know. And they were friends. I don't think that happens today. It's, it's much more uh, vindictive and uh, everything like that. I mean, it's, people don't respect the other person as much. It makes it very difficult to, to do anything because people will just oppose it just because they want to oppose it. I mean, it used to be led to certain understandings, <laughs> like in the, the budget thing. Uh, you know, like this year, for instance, you know, we know there's going to be a tax increase. And usually, before the thing started, you know, the majority party or minority party knows they're going to have to put up some tax votes. Well, they'll try and extract their plan to flush out of the other guy, but they're going to give them the tax votes to get it, keep the government moving. Now, I'm not so sure. They, they're not as mo not as willing, and they they don't want to do the responsible thing. They want to do the political thing. And, uh, no matter, it, it just make it, you know, it, it just makes it difficult to work. And it, it just, uh, and it's happening at all levels of government. It's just, it's 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 hard to see. It's hard for me to to look at, you know, and see what's going on. You know. Do you still stay tuned? It sounds like you still stay stay tuned into what's going on yeah, at least within the state yeah, government. Yeah, I do. I still get some of the emails and so forth that uh, mm -hmm. the stuff going on and listen to it and see it and say, oh, he's doing this. Oh, I said, this is going to work. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah like, <laughs> like and you see if people do stupid things like the fracking industry during the election. They set it out, basically. Uh, now they've got a big camp they're spending millions of dollars saying, don't tax us. They're going to get taxed. <laughs> There's yeah. no way. I mean, where were they when they were, you know, before? I mean, people don't want to believe what, you know, what's reality and what they need to do. It would have made more sense for them at the time to pass a tax, maybe a smaller one, than what they're going to get now. It's sure. like the supervisors back in Murraysville. They want the whole cake. Right. They can't get, they, they think they can get it. They can't. You already mentioned some of the, the people you worked with. Uh, talk about some of the, the leadership that you worked with, worked for governors and majority leaders, speakers during your time there, and what kind of role they played. Okay. Uh, well, it was Herb Feynman. <laughs> it, it was interesting. Uh, uh, one. Herb Feynman was a very strong speaker. Uh, very, did a fairly good job when it comes to his legislative stuff. I remember one time when uh, we had a, uh, there, I think it was my, I think it was my second term. <coughs> Marty Mullen from Philadelphia had decided he was going to challenge Feynman for speakership. The majority party always usually gets the speaker, but it's voted on by the whole house. So if he could split up the Democrat vote, he could elect uh, get elected the speaker. So he's trying to work with the Republicans, <coughs> you know, to get the vote for him, but because he could get maybe 15 or 16 Democrats to go, and then he could be speaker, and yeah, you know, Republicans would get something out of it. Well. I thought, that's going to be interesting. That, that swearing in day was, was really very interesting that year because they actually had some a significant vote uh, with all the families there and the flowers and all this other stuff. Here, here we're having this big fight for speaker. Right. Well, I remember uh, they, they took a, a standing roll call. I've never seen them do that before. But Feynman got about eight or ten Republican votes. Instead of, uh, 
uh, Baldwin was expecting to take all the Republican votes. Well, turns out he's, he had done favors for these guys, and now he called them in. That's the way he operated. He, 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 he kept a big book. He always had, you know, had uh, some favors he could call in when he needed them and so forth. And so he saved himself as a speaker. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't. <laughs> Turned out badly for him later, but, <laughs> yeah. but uh, it was really a, a a novel thing for me to learn uh, at that point in time how how these people work. Uh, um, Mandarino, I tell you what, I, I got so much respect for that guy. I didn't agree with. I probably don't agree with 2% of what he stands for. But uh, he was there when uh, Schapp, uh, Milton Schapp was going through all this uh, corruption stuff. And he, it was one thing after another. The House, House had a Republic, uh, it was a Republican majority. So uh, we were organizing uh, investigating committees and so forth to go after him because we were trying to get the governorship next time. Well, Mandarino was like on that investigating committee and defending Schaap and so forth. He did so much to defend him with so little. It was amazing because he made the Republicans look crazy. And I said, how could that guy do that? <laughs> He's got talent. <laughs> I mean, because everything with, you know, in the Schaap administration was looked bad. There was no way... Of, Painting, but he was able to turn it around and, and you know, the, kept the Republicans from making any footholds in it. Uh, so, uh, you know, it was, it was amazing to see him work, you know, do the way he do those things. Uh, Ken Lee was the Republican uh, speaker. <laughs> he was an interesting guy as far as having respect to the caucus. He was the type of guy. So the caucus would come out, come around and talk about the legislation, and they'd be divided here and there. And Ken would sit back, and then finally he'd come up and say, "Well, this, that, and this, that." Then all of a sudden, everybody's all lined up. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing the talent some of these guys can do. I mean, just from from that standpoint. Um, uh, sometimes they get it wrong. Uh, I remember Butera was the majority leader at the time, was, was making a big thing about uh, we had a, you know, they had passed the income tax the term before, the first time, and everybody was very unpopular. And we had a surplus of money, which Schaap wanted to spend. Peter said, no, we're going to make him refund that money and cut the taxes, and we'll get the credit and we'll win the governorship. Well, he's only half right. <laughs> they refunded the money or cut the taxes. But guess who took the credit for it? <laughs> the governor. <laughs> so, I mean, that stuck with me for all, all the time is that, that, you know, if you're in the minority, don't think <laughs> you're going to change things. You know, people get carried away with what they think they can do, you know, the way it's going to turn out. Uh, <laughs> I say some of the other people. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I say er, Leroy Hervis is very good. <laughs> uh, although. Uh, <laughs> I think I was unjustly accused one time of being a racist or something. <laughs> 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 I, I think he might have been you know, looking a little too far down. And what I, this was before everything was popular, but uh, I think overall he did a de decent job, you know. Uh, every now and then um, <laughs> he was a good conciliator, you know, could, could work with people. Um, I see. Well, what made you want to retire at the point 
that you that you did? Yeah, a few things. Uh, <coughs> one of the main ones was financial. Uh, my daughter was graduating high school and was going to go to college, which is a big number uh, even then. And uh, <coughs> at the time, we were, our salary wasn't that good, and it didn't look like uh, we were going to get a, any increases. So that was another thing. The other thing is that when I first ran, I didn't aspire to be make this a career. In fact, uh, I remember our first term in office when they had a vote for the tax increase. I remember one of our Democratic legislators who had a, you know, put up the majority of votes was, was almost crying on the floor one night saying, he's going to have to vote for this tax increase. And if he does, he's going to lose the election. If he loses the election, he won't be able to work. He won't have anything he can do. And I thought, that's a sad thing. I don't ever want to get in a position like that. And I said, but anyway, I also, also feel that this isn't a, a profession in itself. This should be a volunteer type of thing where you, you know you come in, you pray your service, and then you go on. So that was in some of my thinking as well. Plus the fact that when you're down here, it starts to change you, and some of the changes I didn't like. So. And I figured, you know, it was time. It was time to move on. Um, I still think it was the right time to move on. Um, it wasn't it wasn't the easiest thing to do to transition to something else, but it was. Yeah, your farewell speech wasn't very long, but it had some pointed points in it, yeah. and, and you addressed some of them: the feelings of not being too wedded to this place. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was a special gift to serve and not questioning other members' vote, motives when mm -hmm. they're introducing legislation. Yeah. And you see that, as, I think, as a theme throughout the years. Yeah. 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 I, I know that I questioned the motives that one of my colleagues was questioning me one time on some issue. I forget what it was now. But, like, my motive was personal or whatever else. It, it was totally unfounded. Mm -hmm. It just you know, it, it kind of hurt me a little bit. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I say, you know, take people for what they say. I mean, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt. Now, sure, there are a lot of people in politics that you know, do things for political reasons, but usually, usually you know that. Mm -hmm. Usually you can figure that out. Um, but uh, You said you had an opportunity to run for Senate. Did you have any other opportunities after you retired from the House to seek further office? Uh, I could have run again for my off uh, seat, I guess. Uh, <laughs> you know, the one time I think I was considering it very lightly. I mean, mm -hmm. but not real seriously. <clears throat> uh, but I, I was content just to be out of the political mm -hmm. thing, actually. And what, then, what did you do then with yourself in the years immediately? Uh, after uh, retiring from the House? Well, it's it's not that easy for a retired legislator <laughs> to find work, <laughs> if you, unless you want to be a lobbyist, which I didn't want to be. Mm -hmm. um, but I did, and I went uh, went to Pitt and, and taught in their graduate school information science uh, because of my computer background and, and, and legislative background and so forth. So that was, uh, and I, I'd always been curious about just like I was curious about serving in the legislature, I was curious about well, what it would be like to teach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, well, I don't think I was really cut out to do that. <laughs> <laughs> After a few years, I, uh, I think six, seven years, and then I went on to uh, I went to association, uh, small business trade association, SMC business councils. So. You spent a, a good number of years yeah, uh, representing them. Yeah, twenty years. Yeah. yeah. What was your role within them, and what did you do? What was your role? With oh, it was kind of neat. Uh, like I say, it's, it was hard for me to find a good job fit when I left the legislature. But first of all, because of my background, I've been to so many different things. You know, a lot of times people in careers, they stay in one area and specialize, specialize, specialize. I wasn't. I was, I'm all over the map. So trying to find somebody that, that would wanted to hire me for those qual qualities and would pay me a decent leap was difficult. Um, so anyway, I found 
the uh, associations was, was actually a pretty good fit. I went to this as SMC Business Councils at the time uh, as like the vice president. Uh, as Leo McDonough, who was the president, he, he lobbied us, me during the thing, and he knew me from there and so forth. So I went in there. But it turned out when I got there, they were like in the Stone Age. <laughs> <laughs> it was the, no matter what I did, it was an improvement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was fun because I, I got to use all my different experience, mm -hmm. different sides from the legislative to the computer to the uh, anything, you know, everything I did. I got involved in everything. I read everything about that association, and uh, <coughs> kind of grew with it, and uh, went through a while. And ended up uh, being president for, you know, before I retired. But uh, it was a, it probably as good a uh, post career for a legislator as, as there is. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I say, you always like to be in something that you feel like you're making a difference. You know. And you still made trips to Harrisburg every now and again for, for that organization as well. Hmm? And you still made trips to Harrisburg for that organization. I did. Yeah. Yeah. So you're still sort of connected with the legislative yeah. process. Yeah, we used to have an annual trip. <coughs> well, we had one for in Washington and one in here to, to Harrisburg. And we used to bring a busload of uh, members down and go to lobby and that kind of thing uh, for a day. So, uh, and plus, we used to have uh, legislative events back in Pittsburgh, you know, like mm -hmm. we'd have a reception after the first of the year before. And uh, we'd have a, a captain's group which would meet in different legislative districts to meet with their legislators and so forth. So we tried to promote uh, how they should make their needs known to the legislator and so forth. Looking back now, 30 years after you've been in office, um, what are some of the aspects that you enjoyed the most about serving? Hmm. I guess the friends I made. Uh, you know, like, like I say, uh, you got the... One, one of the, the biggest things I know when I first ran, I got to know areas and people in, the, in my immediate vicinity I had no idea existed before. And uh, it was very eye-opening and uh, 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 that did it. And uh, I think it's kind of changed me somewhat uh, mm -hmm. uh, just to see what, what is there. You know, because like I say, you, you tend to get a very narrow focus when, in life. But when you're forced to go out there and talk to everybody, yes. you get a different viewpoint mm -hmm. on what's going on. Um, You already mentioned regrets about the spending mm -hmm. uh, cap bill being one of your biggest ones. But do you have any other disappointments or any piece of legislation you wish you would have gotten passed while you were here? Uh, no. I mean, that one in the Route 22 bypass were the biggest regrets, yeah. yeah. Uh, I was involved uh, in that last term, particularly in abortion legislation. <laughs> right? Yeah. That was. Uh, that was eye-opening too. I mean, just just to see the animus and people. I mean, how downright angry and hateful people can be. I mean, it just it, you, you toss all the civility out the window. And you, if you're not on the right side, man, you're dog meat. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, what, what would your advice then be to someone wanting to get into public service? Go in for the right reason. I mean, go in and try and, you know, and uh, don't, don't try to make a, a living out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Just, uh, yeah. But uh, you, you can't compromise your principles. You've got to have a moral standard to go by mm -hmm. and stick with it. Yeah. I think my last question then would be, how would you like your term as a, your tenure as a state representative to be remembered? I, I guess how would it be remembered? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I 
uh, uh, did a decent job. And I like to see people think that. Well, they did what he could. Uh, Oh, well, I might mention another thing I did uh, <coughs> my last term. It was kind of off the wall thing. It got to the point where you know you get the feeling of people not uh, getting their moral house in order or whatever. I put together like a, uh, for lack of better words, a retreat for uh, legislators. Mm -hmm. You know, we had about that put out a thing. We got about six or eight legislators that come down, uh, get together, and I got uh, my local priest. And I got down to the Catholic school down in, uh, in town, mm -hmm. and we had a little deck day of reflection and recollection and so forth. And then out of that, I started like a, I'd say not a prayer group, but something like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think once a month we would we would meet. Uh, talk about things that are going on in uh, our lives and mm -hmm. how, how to attack them and how to yeah, keep keep on the right path, that kind of thing. Now, my understanding is that that group survived me for quite a few years. Uh, I don't know if it's, I don't think it's still going on, but it, mm. it was, uh, it did go on for quite a while. Mm -hmm. uh, but I say, I think it's, it's important that you know, there be some kind of grounding for people. Yeah. Well, I really want to thank you for taking part in this project yeah. and talking about your, your legislative yeah. experiences and your experiences in general. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.